Every minute, an area the size of a soccer or football field, depending on where you watch this from, is clear-cut in the Amazon basin, which, because of feedbacks of the forest on its own climate, may be on the brink of turning into a savanna. Over half of the original 6 million square miles of rainforest that blanketed much of the tropics has been clear-cut. In the United States, less than 21% of old-growth forests still exist. In the U.S. Midwest, only a tiny fraction of the original tallgrass prairie remains, with less than one-tenth of one percent of the original tallgrass prairie remaining in Iowa. With the destruction of the flora that makes up an ecosystem, the associated fauna disappears as well. The mind-boggling amount of habitat destruction that has happened and continues to happen is the current greatest contributor to the biodiversity crisis we are in. Something to freak out about. Habitat destruction's primary impact is rendering areas completely changed and uninhabitable to certain native species. But it also leaves behind habitat fragments that remain uncleared and seemingly natural, but are uninhabitable as well. To understand how habitat fragmentation leads to the defaunation in an untouched fragment, you need to understand the theory of island biogeography, which I fortunately have made a video on, so go back and watch that for a deeper explanation of this concept which is critical in conservation biology today. Okay, you understand island biogeography? So let's continue. When a patch of habitat is split off from a larger contiguous area, which can be as major as mass land conversion or as minor as being bisected by a road, it effectively becomes an island. Roads are actually quite deceptive because they are really imposing barriers for many animals to cross, despite only being at most a few tens of meters wide but many small animals simply cannot traverse them, and big roads like major highways can even prove difficult for even large mammals to cross. Even some species that can fly, like birds, can have trouble going over roads, as some tropical forest specialists simply won't fly through such a large open space. Once a fragment forms and its individual organisms are isolated from those elsewhere, the principles of island biogeography set in. The patch may be too small to support a viable population of a certain species, or the small population remaining may be more susceptible to random events that lead to local extinction. This creates a lag time between the fragmentation event and the local extinction of a certain species. This lag towards a new equilibrium is called extinction debt, which is a calculation of how many species in a patch are likely to go extinct and how long it will take before this happens, referred to as the relaxation time. For example, long-lived species like trees may take hundreds of years to finally disappear from a patch, while smaller, short-lived animals usually disappear in a decade or so. The concept of extinction debt is important in preserve design, which can be thought of as fragments themselves, informing that larger preserves are better for preserving more biodiversity than smaller ones. In conjunction with size, another factor makes habitat fragments unsuitable for native species. Edge effects. When the area around a fragment is cleared, the edges of the fragment change biotically and abiotically. Cleared land absorbs energy differently than forest, for example, having more variable day and night temperatures. This creates a temperature gradient between forest and open land, with the edges of the forest being intermediate between the two in temperatures. As one can imagine, wind also blows through forest and open land differently. So the bit of forest on the edge of the fragment again will be more intermediate in wind between deeper forest and clear-cut land. This unnaturally higher wind also increases tree mortality on the edges. These changes in the edge interact with biological communities in other ways. Some species are forest specialists that avoid the edges and remain in the core area of the fragment, while open land species may colonize the edges of the patch, competing against forest species. These edge effects are something that must be considered when protecting an area, as maximizing the area of the core protects more species. For example, two hypothetical preserves could have the same overall area, but very different core area size. Thus, fragments that are more like a square or circle are considered better for protecting native habitat than rectangular, ellipsoid, or very irregular fragments. Fortunately, there is a way to fight fragmentation, habitat restoration. By helping native plants reclaim degraded habitat, core areas can be expanded, and if a wildlife corridor is constructed between two fragments, it can allow animals to migrate between the two fragments, essentially making one large fragment. Knowing about edge effects can help inform how to construct wildlife corridors, making them wide enough to maintain the more homogeneous environmental conditions of core areas, allowing specialist species to travel more easily. 
As fragments become larger, closer together, and are interconnected, like large islands, they can hold more species, and it will be more likely for species to migrate into the area, paying the extinction debt with immigration credit. Habitat destruction and fragmentation is a huge issue which is not always easy to correct, usually involving years of removing invasive weeds and planting native trees. However, even regular people can help by planting native species and making their own small preserve that can help smaller native species thrive and move between remnant patches. This video is part of an ongoing Fundamentals of Conservation Biology series with a new episode coming out each and every month. So if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to this channel, and ring the bell so you can be notified when the next video in this series comes out. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. Bye.